Thank you. So good afternoon to everyone, and uh, many thanks for uh, attending the SRV6 network programming uh, workshop. Uh, my name is Ahmed Abdesalam. I'm a software engineer at the segment routing. Uh, my PhD on segment routing, I contribute also to the SRV6 uh, code in the Linux kernel. And I also presented SRV6 before at the NetFilter workshop in, um, in 2019. Uh, still helping some of our uh, ecosystem partners from academia on the SRV6 support in open source and especially the Linux kernel. Today we have a quite uh, interesting agenda uh, for, uh, for this uh, workshop. We have a lot of interesting uh, content. I will start the first part with uh, an SRV6 update where we're go I'm going to introduce you a bit the technologies, the standardization and the deployment. Then we will have uh, Professor Stefano Salsani uh, remotely, who is going to give us an update on the SRV6 uh, research that they have been doing at the university and the efforts that we have done in, um, in SRV6 support in open source. Then we have here Andrea Meyer, who will give us an update on the SRV6 support in the Linux kernel. Andrea is from the University of Rome, Tor Vergata, and he is one of the main contributors to the SRV6 code in the Linux kernel. Also good uh, today, we have the, the other main contributor in, uh, in the room, David Lebrun, who wrote the first code for SRV6 in the Linux kernel. Then after that, we will have uh, Dan Bernier, a technical director from Bell Canada, who is going to give us an update on the SRV6 uh, implementation in EPPF and Cilium for the NFV and the container use cases. The last two sessions of this workshop is going to be dedicated to SRV6 support in Sonic. So as a first session, we will have Reshma, an engineering director from Intel, who is going to give us an update on the SRV6 support in Sonic and what we are right now and what are the next steps. And finally, we have Carmine, who is from the University of Rome, Tor Vergata also, who will give us an update on the SRV6 support in FRR, the open source um, free range routing, and also the ongoing efforts to Im integrate SRV6 into Sonic. With that, let me actually jump to the first part of the presentation, which is an update on SRV6 technology standardization and deployment. First of all, I would really like to send a big thank you to all of the lead operators and all of the ecosystem partners from academia, open source and partners. Indeed, it's the 10th anniversary of the segment routing technology, the project that was started in 2012. In this uh, last 10 years, we really have uh, done a great uh, progress. So many thanks to everyone. Thanks also to the segment uh, routing team at Cisco. And uh, it's really a pleasure to work with all of those uh, ecosystem partners. I have only 20 minutes here in this presentation, so I'm going to be a bit uh, quick introducing the technology, but we maintain the segment-routing.net website where you will have all of the materials on segment routing, including tutorials, demos. You will have also some materials on the latest innovation in segment routing, including the past racing uh, project, which I will cover uh, briefly at the end of this presentation. <clears throat> so let's start actually with the actual content, which is the SRV6. So in an SRV6 network, we're going to offer services to customer packets. So we have a customer packet, as you see here in green. This customer packet can be a layer two Ethernet frame, an IBV4 packet or IBV6 packet. In this example, we have an IBV4 packet. The customer packet gets to the ingress for the router, so PE router one in this example, where this packet is going to be encapsulated with an outer IBV6 header and a potential segment routing extension header. The blue header that you see here in this example, the blue header will be transported over the SRV6 domain up to the egress for the router, the BE router number two, where the packet gets decapsulated and the blue header is removed and the actual customer packet is sent to the customer side. So as you see here, everything is applied to the outer header. So 
the the customer bucket is never uh, is never touched, and this is completely transparent service. And when we say we use SRV6 to deliver service, it means we apply SRV6 to the outer encapsulation, the blue encapsulation that you have here, not to the customer bucket. So it's completely transparent service. The heart of the SRV6 technology is basically the network programming. This is a proposed standard in RFC 8986. And what this network programming says is that any end-to-end -end policy can be encoded as a network program. And as any program, it has a list of instructions. The first instruction is encoded in the destination address of the packet. The remaining instruction is encoded in the segment routing extension header. And the network programming is already a proposed standard in RFC 8986. So any end-to-end -end policy is encoded as a network program. The network program has a set of instruction, and each instruction we call it segment ID or SID for short. And this SID can be bound to any behavior. So I can use the SID to deliver a free range uh, uh, to an, um, a faster route. I can use it to uh, encode a micro load avoidance. I can use the SID to deliver a traffic engineering. I can use the SID to deliver. Any, lay, any kind of layer two, uh, layer two or layer three VPN. I can, you, I can bound the seed also to any uh, NFV behavior, but actually you can bound the seed to any custom behavior. So my seed can be bound to a P4 program in hardware that will provide a, customer hard, a custom hardware be, uh, behavior. I can also bound the seed to any custom software behavior. By bounding this seed to a software program, or any container orchestrated by Kubernetes to provide a custom behavior. And with this, you get a very powerful service creation solution. Why? Because any service I need to deploy or I need to, to achieve can be encoded as a network program. And in this network program, I have a set of instruction. This set of instruction can be VPN combined with traffic engineering, combined with NFV, and combined with any custom behavior. All of this is achieved through a stateless fabric because the state of the packet, the state is encoded in the packet. So the network program that we have is encoded in the packet header, but not in the network fabric. And this is basically the recipe to have an ultra scale network fabric. Packet or state is in the packet header, but never in the network fabric. The segment routing extension header is an RFC, uh, proposed standard in RFC 8754. This is completely foreseen for 25 years now when the base IBV6 uh, architecture was defined 25 years ago in uh, RFC 2460. Indeed, the IBV6 architecture is designed with extension headers, um, with extension header, one of these extension header is the routing extension header. And the segment routing header is basically a natural child of this architecture. It's a new type or a new type of the routing header. We talked before that about the network programming and the network program. An end-to-end -end policy is represented or is encoded as a network program. The list this network program has a list of in, uh, in, um, instructions. We call them SIDs. The active SID of this program is always in the destination address of the packet. The remaining SIDs are in the SRH. And you have a pointer here in the SRH called the segment left, which tells you where you are with the execution of this network program. Or in other words, what are the next instructions to be executed? SRV6 basically gives you also the reachability required for 5G and also for the hyperscale data center where you have really millions and millions of containers. Why? Because SRV6 is nothing but IBV6. There is no shim header on top of IBV6 or anything. It's a purely IBV6. And IBV6 is at the UE. You have IBV6 at the host, at the smartphone, at the access metro core data center. And here we go. We recovered a unified data plane that can go from 
the container from the socket to the access to the metro, to the core, and to the data center. Just for, for the sake of time, if you're really interested to know more about SRV6 and how and why operator have uh, chosen SRV6, I invite you to watch this uh, recording and I will leave you the link in the presentation. And But let's have a, a, a reality check on where we are with the SRV6 deployment and ecosystem right now. So for SRV6, we have a record speed deployment, the same as we had for SR MPLS. We have a three years of commercial deployments from 2019 to 2022. We have 100 million subscribers and, um, uh, supported by SRV6 services. We know about 100 deployment, 14 of them is already public. You have the list of the deployment here on this slide. The blue one are the new one. And we have deployment across the several market segments, web service provider and enterprise, and covers all of the geographies in Africa, Asia, uh, Europe, and US. One of the very interesting deployments here, and I want to highlight it, is basically the SRV6 deployment at Iliad. So basically, Iliad did a nationwide SRV6 deployment in Italy. And what the, as part of this deployment, they used the SRV6 implementation in the Linux kernel to build their own white box. So basically, the SRV6 implementation that we have in the Linux kernel is deployed in a live network in Italy. And so for this, I would like to thank all of the NetDev community and all of the people who contributed to that code especially because I live in Italy and my cell phone is uh, connection is through that operator. So every time I make a call, I use the part of, uh, of the code, which I, some of it I already wrote uh, at some point when I was doing my PhD. So many thanks for, to everyone. Our commitment really to uh, our uh, to SRV6 operator is always the same. A standard-based technology, very rich, uh, ecosystem both from vendor and open source point of view. From a standardization point of view, we have a six uh, proposed standard RFCs for SRV6. The speed of standardization here is much, much faster than the norm of IETF. And this is basically an endorsement of the industry for the SRV6 um, solution. I leave you here the, num um, the RFC numbers, more to come by the way. Uh, we have a very rich uh, SRV6 ecosystem, both from vendor and open source point of view. So we have more than 25 hardware line rate implementation for SRV6. You have all of the names uh, already there. We have also a very rich open source ecosystem with more than 16 open source uh, stacks that support SRV6 right now. And we have also a, a many successful interops both at ENTC, at Japan, or Nanog, and I will leave you the details here in the slide. In the next part, I would like also to introduce an, uh, something, uh, um, uh, uh, part of the SRV6 solution, which is the SRV6 microSIT. From industry point of view, we call it SRV6 micro segment, or SRV6 UCID, or belief, briefly UCID. From IETF point of view, this is standardized as the next CSID flavor. Let's start with, from the SRV6 network programming. We have seen this slide before, and we said the SRV6 network programming, which is defined in RFC 8986, basically encodes an end-to-end -end policy as a network program. This network program is a list of instructions each instruction is called a segment ID or SID, and the SID can be bound to any behavior. That is exactly what we said before. What I'm going to add here in for micro SID is that the SID or the instruction that is part of this network program can be compound to a container SID. And this container SID includes up to six micro instructions. But let's look how this container seed looks like. So I have a 128 bits seed. 
this 128-bit seed, I'm going to use it into two parts. The first part is called the block. And the block can be slash 16, slash 32, or slash 48. We recommend slash 32, so I'm going to give the illustration using slash 32. So we have a slash 32 block. And in the remaining bits, I can have up to six micro instructions. Each of these six micro instructions can be bound to any behavior the same way that we explained for the seed before. And the program encoded in this container seed, it's very intuitive. And let me read it for you. We read it from the left or right. So within this micro seed block, take the short pass to node one, then take the short pass to node two, then take the short pass to node three, then take the short pass to node four, then to node five, and then to node six. And then we reach at node six, we look at the segment routing header. If there is another container seed in the segment routing header, we take this container seed from the segment routing header, we put it in the destination address, and we continue. And we decrement the segment lift because we have already used one of the container seeds that we have in the, in the segment routing header. This is a, a quite a brief introduction or explanation to the SRV6 micro seed in one single slide. The SRV6 micro seed was basically invented in 2016 when we defined the SRV6 solution. So it has been thought from the beginning as part of the overall SRV6 solution. So it perfectly integrates with the SRV6 SRH defined in RFC 8754 with no change at all. Also, it perfectly integrates with the SRV6 network programming model that we explained that is proposed the standard in RFC 8986. And as we said, a micro seed can be bound to any instruction, NFV, TEA traffic engineering, layer two, layer three VBN, or any, um, any custom behavior. Here you can see a big advantage of, S of SRV6 micro seed. It's basically, it provides the best compression because in one single hand, uh, seed, we can carry up to six micro instruction. So here on, the, on this slide, you can see on the, on the X axis, I have the number of segments that I need. And on the Y axis, I have the MTU overhead that I need to carry those seeds. For example, if you take for 10 seeds with the uh, uh, classic SRV6, you need 208 bytes. While in the case of a service six, you need only 64 bytes. This is three times less in um, terms of MTU overhead. The SRV6 microseed is already in deployment at several operators. I leave you here in the slides a link for, for the talk by those operators if you want to know more details about the deployment. And as always, we are committed for the, op for, for the ecosystem. So we have a very rich uh, ecosystem also for SRV6 microseed. You can see all of the names here on, on the slides, but we have also a very rich open source ecosystem. So SRV6 microseed is already supported in the main line of the Linux kernel. In the P4, we have a P4 implementation. We have an EPPF implementation. We have uh, an implementation in FDI OVBP and other um, uh, stacks. Also, if you want to learn more about the micro seed and all of the details, I invite you also to watch that, uh, that recording and I will leave you the link in the slides. The very last part of my presentation is one of the latest innovation in uh, SRV6. I would really have liked to have more time to, to talk about this innovation, but I'm going to try to introduce it quite uh, briefly. So it is called pass tracing. And let me start to, to introduce you what is a, what is a problem a statement that we have here. And as always with the, with the segment routing projects, we like to go back to the root and the purity of, of IP. And we sometimes ask some naive questions. And the question here is that, how come if you have a packet from A to F, 
we don't know the actual bus that the packet takes in this in this network because you can have several ECMP passes. You can see here I have four. Which one of these passes my packet takes from A to F, I don't actually know. But it could very well be that you have a, a FIP corruption or an issue in any of the line cards in the network that causes the packet to take a, not, a, a different pass or a pass different from the ECMP, you wouldn't know either. But it could be also be that you have a kind of black hole in the network and some of those packets are being lost. You wouldn't know either where those packets are being lost. So pass tracing is really a solution to give you a, a solution to allow you to deterministically detect the exact path that the packet takes from node A, from a given node to another node. So it gives you a full visibility in the path that the packet takes in the network. But on top of that, we get the delay at each node by having a timestamp at each node that forwards the packet and the load on each interface that forward this packet. The most important thing is that to make such technology work, you need really to measure in the most basic pipeline of the, of the device. So any solution that would bump this packet to a line card, the CPU, or to a coprocessor that does not use the exact same forwarding table as the customer packet is not useful. So all of these ideas that we have here in pass tracing have been engineered to be implemented at line rate, in hardware, at, uh, in the most basic pipeline and effective for any, for, any, for any packet. We do all of these by collecting only three bytes of information from each hub. So each hub on the packet pass is going to record three bytes of information to represent which outgoing interface uh, that forwards the packet what was the timestamp or the time at uh, when the interface forwards the packet and what was the load on that uh, on that interface indeed pass tracing is already supported at line rates in several um, hardware uh, implementation and i will show you later the ecosystem for uh, for pass tracing but before let me explain to you briefly how actually it does work so i am interested to measure all of the passes that i have between node A and node F, or in other words, I want to understand the packet experience in, in the passes between node A and node F. So at node A, I'm going to generate a packet with source address A, so a probe packet from A to F, so source address equal A, destination address equal F, very basic, simple IBV6. In this packet, I'm going to have a hop by hop header. The hop by hop header is one of the extension header that was defined for IBV6 more than 25 years ago. And this hop, in this hop by hop header, I'm going to have a pass tracing option. And this pass tracing option, we use it as a passport. The, the, um, how to say, uh, the analogy that we use, where each node is going to stamp its information. So packet goes from node A, node A records its information, Packet goes then to node B, it records three bytes of information, then node E, then packet arrive at node F, where the destination address equal node F. I'm going to timestamp this packet, encapsulate it, and send it to a controller or a collector. At this collector, I'm going to extract this information and use it to build or detect the exact path that the packet takes in, uh, in the network. And the delay at each hub and the load on each interface that forward this packet. All of this information, we're going to save it in a time series database. So you basically have a full history of the status of your fabric over time. From an ecosystem, as always, we are committed to build the ecosystem for the technology. So we share this idea with Broadcom, with Marvel, very interesting feedback and very good partnership. Indeed, as um, uh, uh, pass tracing is already supported in the native SDK from Broadcom, and we have implementation in, in Marvel at Cisco. This is something that we already shipping in this calendar year. We have also reviewed this idea with many operators. 
many of them are very interesting and some of them already are testing this technology in their lab and from open source point of view we have a very rich open source uh, ecosystem with implementation in linux fdio p4 wireshark and tcp dump and uh, the linux implementation we're going to submit it soon to the uh, to the linux kernel to be reviewed and merged and obviously we submitted the idea to ietf for uh, standardization just to conclude uh, quickly in just three words so as we always say in simplicity always prevails in srv6 we always take simple solution to solve customer uh, problems and if you want to learn more about uh, segment routing the, we have uh, two segment routing books and the third one should be coming uh, soon and we have and uh, maintain the segmentrouting.net website where you have all of the materials on um, on SRV6 and many thanks to everyone and if you have uh, questions I would be happy uh, to to answer them if not maybe we can go to the next uh, slide or the next part Stefano on is is participating remotely so I don't know, Stefano, if you want to share your no. uh, slides. Yes. Yes, I'm trying to share my screen. Yes, we so. see. No. I can try to show again, but uh, the system is telling that another another user is, is sharing. Let me see if now it works. Okay, Can you try again? Do you see my screen now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So hi everybody. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I could not join uh, the um, the meeting in Lisbon. So I'll try to give this presentation remotely. Uh, I'm presenting the. Uh, Rose project research on open uh, SRV6 uh, ecosystem. And this is uh, an umbrella project that started in uh, 2017 to develop and maintain uh, an open source ecosystem for SRV6. So it's a complement to what Hamed was, uh, was saying. Um, the, the, this project has contributed to the standardization of uh, SRV6. And uh, it has, uh, uh, the project has received funding by uh, by Cisco under the Cisco University Research Project Program. So it, the project includes several sub-projects, more than 10, related to multiple uh, aspects of uh, SRV6 technology. So we covered the uh, data plane, control plane, the, the host networking stack, and we tried to cover also integration with application and, or with, with the cloud and data center uh, infrastructures. Uh, there is a home page of the project. Here uh, you, you read uh, the, um, uh, the, the web URL. So I invite you to, to, to go to the, to the web for further uh, details. I, I'm just giving a very, very quick uh, introduction and a couple of pre presentations that uh, will follow uh, on today are uh, actually sub-projects sub of, uh, of this Rose uh, uh, ecosystem. So this is just a, a, a pictorial uh, overview of the different uh, aspects that we are trying to, to address in, in, this, in this ecosystem. There is uh, the data plane part, uh, and in particular, the Linux kernel implementation. And uh, Andrea will, will give uh, a, a detailed description of, uh, of this uh, uh, Linux kernel implementation of, uh, of SRV6. Uh, on the data plane, uh, we did also some work on uh, on P4, several uh, uh, SRV6 uh, uh, um, features uh, have been implemented uh, using P4. Uh, then uh, we have developed uh, uh, also our controller to to uh, to control uh, uh, Linux-based uh, uh, nodes, so we can uh, 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 implement uh, um, uh, a wall network. Uh, uh, with a, a software-defined uh, SDN-based approach where we have our own controller and we can configure uh, 
um, Linux based uh, um, routers to, to, to implement uh, a service six features. And also we have some we have done some work in the part that uh, that's related to the collection of, of uh, for example of measurement uh, um, and on the orchestration also of these uh, um, services. So of course in the web page you will find the, the, the links to the to the different sub projects and of course they are uh, open source projects that so so we, you will find the uh, um, the, the code uh, released. Um, so this is a, a sample of, uh, of the sub projects. Some of the sub projects, the Linux kernel data plane, and Andrea will uh, will uh, give the next presentation on this. Also, we have been working on on uh, microseeds, uh, both in um, Linux kernel and uh, P4 uh, implementation. Also, we have been working on path tracing. Or the, so these are the 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 features that uh, Hamed has just presented, they have been uh, implemented in open source under these uh, Rose, uh, Rose projects. Um, I will give uh, in the next two slides uh, um, uh, a very, very short in, uh, overview of this project about uh, um, tutorials related to SRV6. So, so these are good starting point if you want to start uh, coding or experimenting with SRV6. And finally, I will give a, a an overview of the work that we are doing to um, introduce SRV6 in, uh, in Kubernetes. So, yeah, this is uh, the link that you will find in the, in the slide uh, to um, a virtual machine that is uh, available for tutorial and development purposes. And it includes uh, an emulated uh, network environment based on Mininet uh, and relies on the Linux kernel for implementing the service six data plane. So you will find a, a reasonable topology with eight routers and tens of hosts, and you can start uh, um, uh, trying out uh, the, the, um, the data plane features that are implemented in Linux kernel. And in particular, there are two step-by-step -step tutorials on how to create uh, SRV6 tunnels in the Linux uh, SRV6 data plane, and also a tutorial on how you can use uh, our own uh, control plane uh, to set up uh, uh, SRV6 tunnels using our uh, uh, SDN controller. Uh, finally, the, um, this is the link to a very recent project that we have very recently uh, released. It's a uh, Kate's SRV6, uh, and it extends uh, Kubernetes uh, to make use of SRV6. Uh, in particular, we have extended uh, the Calico VPP, uh, which is uh, a networking plugin of Kubernetes, uh, with uh, a new uh, SRV6 overlay. And so, as far as uh, we know, this is uh, the first uh, uh, um, networking plugin of Kubernetes that supports uh, SRV6, and uh, it. it you, you can uh, do uh, encapsulation of both uh, IPv4 and IPv6 uh, um, uh, networks uh, at the pods level, at Kubernetes pods, and you can do traffic engineering uh, of the tunnels that, that you create, thanks to the traffic engineering feature that can you, you can implement using uh, uh, SRV6. So this is... Uh, mm, you will find uh, um, a list of uh, scientific papers that we have been working in this, uh, that we have been producing this year about uh, um, this open source stuff. Um, you find the complete list uh, in the, uh, the web page. But I like to highlight this uh, this paper, which is uh, a, a tutorial. It's a, um, a survey of research activities and also a tutorial on SRV6, it has been published uh, uh, last year in the IEEE Communication Service and, and Tutorials. And I think that's that's it for this very, very quick uh, introduction. Thank you for, for your attention. And uh, I can take care of now, but also my colleague, uh, Andrea Mayer and Carmen Scarpita that are uh, there uh, in, uh, in, in Lisbona, that they can also answer question about this uh, uh, Rose ecosystem.
what is the full time. So I think that the next speaker will be Andrea Meyer. Yes, he's here. Okay. So I'll stop presenting. Okay. Uh, can I start? Okay. Good. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am Andrea Mayer. I'm my post PhD at uh, University of Vergata. Um, I'm working here as a researcher at CNIT on several projects. Uh, as you may guess, all, all those projects are related to network stuff. So uh, my main interests are on Linux kernel networking stack and specifically on segment routing. And I've been a contributor. I'm still a contributor to the service XAP system of the Linux kernel. So uh, today I would like to take you with me in a very quick journey across the evolutions of SRV6 uh, in the various Linux kernel releases. So we start from the initial support of Servgram routing, then we go to our contribution in both kernel space and user space, and then we will discuss what next, what will be the next feature that we want, we would like to add in the kernel, and then we draw some conclusions about what we did so far. So very, very quickly, uh, it's a, it's a bit choppy here, the image. So um, very, very quickly, the support for Linux, for the support for segment routing uh, in Linux uh, appears for the first time with version 4.10, thanks to David Lebrun. And uh, it implement, uh, here we have an implementation with a very minimal support for uh, as our enabled packet. It means that we have two main features. One feature is we have encapsulation, uh, SRH encapsulation, encapsulation insertion for IPv6 packet. And this is possible because uh, a new lightweight tunnel has been created for doing this. And also we have another feature that take care of segment and points processing. And here we can do basically two things. We can advance the current segment to the next one and we take care uh, for the uh, with the care of the aggregates of packets, so it means that we can remove the uh, outer IPv6 plus the SRH. Um, the IP2 uh, the IP2 was extended to support such feature in the kernel. So uh, here, this is a very simple example to for creating a route uh, SRV6 tunnel. Here we can add a route. We can specify the destination that of packet that will be encapsulated. Here we also specify which is the encapsulation, in this case, is segment routing and the encap mode that can be O at T encaps or at T insert. And then we had the seed list, uh, the segment that will be part of the seed list that will push into the uh, SRH. Um, things get quite interesting in version of kernel 4.14 uh, because the um, SRV6 subsystem get improved quite a lot. Here we have the full support for encapsulating IP4 packet and for encapsulating L2 Ethernet frames in INAP uh, plus the SRH, even though with some caveats. But the main things here are that for the first time we have full support for advanced log and S segmenting uh, processing. And this is done also through another lightweight tunnel, which was built for this purpose, that is uh, called SexA Local. And here we have implemented many local behaviors, which spans from n.x, n.t, n.x4, and so on. And the most important thing here is that all those local behavior can be configured uh, with different parameters or attributes that can be provided by the user space through uh, IP root 2. Indeed, IP root 2 was extended to support the advanced log segment processing. So we are able to set up and destroy local behaviors, uh, as well as we can sh we can show up all the instantiated uh, behavior with the all user provided attributes. Uh, this is another example, but sorry, because uh, it's a little bit messed with the image. Uh, we have, um, we can define a seg say local. Uh, it means a local, a local behavior. We can decide which is the active seed to be bound to a specific behavior. And uh, in this case, we have to change the encap, which is sex a local, and then the behavior is the hand. So the action here is the end action. 
uh, if the uh, behavior requires more attributes, more parameter, uh, we have to provide them because at this stage, attributes were only mandatory. And in, in this case, for instance, the end.t requires the table uh, attributes that should be valorized. In kernel version 4.16, uh, uh, NetFilter support uh, uh, SRH. It, it means that we can uh, have matching on a specific part of the SRH, for instance, on the next header, on the extension header, on the second left. And this is quite interesting because we, in NetFilter, we can buy several extensions to build up very complex filter chain and uh, do some interesting action. For instance, we can implement networking packet loss monitoring, delay, delay monitoring, and, and so on. Um, in Linux kernel version 4.18, uh, we have a very uh, interesting improvement because we have for the first time introductions a new action, which is called n.bbf. And this n.bbf work li works like uh, uh, n an end behavior uh, it means that we need to have the SRH and uh, it automatically it advances the current segment to the next one. But in addition, the NBBF provide a hook for attaching a user-defined user -defined APBF program to this specific behavior, instance of behavior. But uh, it, cannot write direct, it cannot write directly into the packet for safety reasons. And uh, the uh, APBF program attached to uh, an end.bbf uh, behavior can only change or modify only some fields of the SRH, which are flags, tags, and TLV, through some dedicated helper function. Uh, obviously, IP2 was extended to support the end.ppf, and it allows to load and attach an APBF program. So uh, uh, it, in order to uh, create a new end.ppf instance, it's enough to add the endpoint in the command line, specify which is the file object with con that contains the uh, a, a APFF program, as well as the section where the APF program should be take. Oh, sorry. Um, from kernel uh, 5.5, we extended the locally delivery for the capsulated packet in the end.bt6. Uh, end and in Linux kernel version 5.9, we extended the virtual routing and forwarding subsystem. Uh, because the verf is an enabling key for implementing new SRV6 behavior that were not implemented in the kernel yet at the time. And we extended the VRF uh, to support a new overriding mode, and this new overriding mode is called strict mode. Uh, the strict mode imposes a one-to-one -one relationship between a verf and its associated routing table. Uh, um, if you want to turn on the strict mode, you need to act on a CCTL knob, which is uh, network and space aware. And by default, the strict mode is turned off for uh, legacy purposes. Um, in the uh, Linux version uh, 5.11, uh, the logger processing for uh, SRV6 has been subjected to an heavy lifting. Here, we improve the management of behaviors attribute. Uh, we had for the first time the support for options attribute can be used by behavior. And also we had some callbacks for customizing and, destroy and destroying uh, behavior instances. So all this feature within the uh, verf extension allow us to implement for the first time the n.tt4 behavior, which is able to decapsulate inner IPv4 packet and perform um, lookups, routing lookups into a given routing table. Uh, because of the n.tt4 uses the verf, uh, through the verf we are able to force the routing lookup in a specific L3 domain. Uh, in the same kernel release, we also provide an extension to the uh, already existing n.dt6. So uh, it also, uh, the dt6 in the, from this release and on is also uh, aware of the verf. So it can be used for using verf. Uh, this is a very quick uh, high level view on how the dt4 uh, behavior process packet. I will not go too much here in detail, but it's important to know that when we find out which is the active seed, we trigger the end.4. Uh, we uh, decapsulate the inner packet, and then we use the associated verb to route and forward the packet towards the right uh, target, towards the right destination. Uh, as you may guess, the IP2 was extended to support both the DT4 and the DT6 in verf mode. Uh, and this is a very snip of code. Uh, 
uh, to show how, how easy it is to set up ADT4. The first thing we need to do is to turn on the strict mode. Otherwise, the uh, for, uh, you cannot use the DT4. Uh, and then we create, for instance, here a new verf bound to a table 100. And then we uh, create a new rule, a new route where we specify the active seed as an action. We specify the end of D4 and the verf table uh, that should be used by this specific instance of the end DT4 to route and forward traffic. In uh, version of kernel 5.13, we add for the first time the support for counters, uh, counters for only logger processing. And here we have that for each behavior instance, we are able to keep track of the total number of correctly processed packets. We are able to track the traffic uh, uh, which is correctly processed. And also we are able to count the number of packets that have not been correctly processed. Uh, this is interesting because counters allow us for the first time in the sub SRV6 subsystem to build uh, network monitoring uh, system. It allows us to check whether a behavior works like suspected or not. And, and uh, it gives me, it allows us uh, to understand if something uh, doesn't work as well for troubleshooting purposes, I mean. Counters can be turned on and turned off on per behavior, per, per behavior basis. And IPR2 was extended for doing this. Um, in this example here, what we can see is that uh, we want to, we would like to instantiate a new end behavior for a given seed, uh, and we want to counters turn it on. It's quite easy because we only had this count optional attribute, and then when this count optional attribute is turned on, we have statistics for this specific uh, behavior. Uh, to show the value of such statistics, it's enough to add in the IP route show command minus s, and we will show. Uh, the value of the packets, bytes, and error. Um, in Linux kernel 5.14, uh, we add the support for the end uh, DT46. Uh, this is because end DT4 and end DT6, with, with both of them, we uh, are not, it's not possible to create SRV6 tunnel which are able to handle both of both inner IPv4 and uh, inner IPv6 at the same time. And uh, instead, the entity DT46 is capable to decapsulate both IPv4 and IPv6 traffic and route such traffic to uh, VERF. The DT46 reuses as much as possible the, implement, uh, the core implementation of the DT4 and the DT6 uh, in VERF mode. And as you may guess, you need to, to turn on the, you, we need to turn on the strict mode in order to make it work. Uh, we studied the performance of uh, DT46 and we experienced no degradation at all. So it means that we can use DT46 rather than DT4 and DT6 uh, because this greatly, greatly simplifies the setup of SRV6 ne networks, specifically on the VPNs implementation. Um, in feature that is uh, an option at filter hook for as services processing it's very useful for um, if you want to contract both inner flows and outer flows uh, by default the, such hooks are turned on and if you want to turn uh, turn it off if you want to turn it on you need to act on a system-wide CTL and uh, it is this allow us to uh, enable and filter hooks um, in the one of the latest kernel releases in 6.0, we had for the first time the support for the add and reduce behavior. So we have both implemented the ncaps.red and the l2 ncaps.red. Uh, the idea behind the uh, reduced ncap is that with them, we can reduce the length of the seed list uh, because we remove the first segment from the seed list and we can push it directly into the uh, uh, destination address of the outer IPv6. So in this way, uh, with the NCAP reduced, we can avoid the SRH at all if we are considering SRV6 policies that, co uh, that contains only one seed. And uh, obviously, IP2 was extended to support this new operating mode. Uh, um, the extension was uh, very straightforward. And uh, the only thing that we, that we should do in order to use an ncap.red rather than an ncap is to change the mode. And uh, the seed list uh, uh, is, uh, is the same. We, not, we, not, we don't need to change the seed list because the kernel under the hood 
uh, apply the reduced operation. So we can substitute uh, with no pain uh, an old NCAP with NCAP.red. Um, we understood that there may be some SRV6 scenarios where uh, the seed list could be very long. And uh, we would like to reduce the size of the seed list as much as possible. So because minimizing the seed list length allows to uh, minimize the impact on MTU. And at the same time, it enables uh, segment routing to run also on legacy hardware, which has not very, which has very limited power. So since kernel version 6.1, which is uh, a release candidate, we introduced for the first time the next seed which is also known as micro seed of the seed as presented uh, Ahmed before. And this is a mechanism for segment routing, which gave us a very efficient representation or compressions of the seed list. So we can take several SRV6 segment and encode them within, 100, one, within 128 bits of seed. The next seed mechanism relies, uh, is built upon the flavors uh, framework, which are defined in the network programming model. And flavors give us the uh, um, opportunity to add additional operation that can modify or extend existing behavior. So what we did is took the end behavior and then we extended it by supporting the next uh, flavor. Uh, the IP root, oh sorry, the IP root uh, has been uh, um, extended, and then we had a new attribute which is called flavors. So when the flavor, when we um, when we define a new hand behavior and we want to turn on the next seed compression for the end, it's, uh, it's enough to have the flavor um, attribute and then specify which is the currently seed, the, the, the currently uh, flavors, which, which is in this case is only the next seed because the kernel actually implement only this one. And um, we can also specify two sub-nested uh, options attribute, which are the locator block length and the locator not function length. Those are completely optional. If you don't specify them, the kernel will pick up for us the default values. Um, so what's next? Uh, we are still working quite a lot on service six feature in the kernel, and we also have to maintain and cooperate on the whole SRV6 subsystem, bug fixing, performance tests. And this is a brief list of the upcoming desired feature that we'd like to introduce, hopefully, in the next kernel releases. So we'd like to extend some of the ABBF helper for supporting the uh, add end and cap uh, with reduced version. We would like to uh, um, complete the implementation, the implementation for the flavors, PSP, USP, USD. Uh, we are working, we uh, work on the path tracing protocol, the one that I made exposed to you before. We have already an implementation and it, and it leverages the segment routing subsystem. And also we would like to provide a full L2 VPN based on SRV6, which on a new interface, a new virtual interface, because it allow us to overcome the limitation that are brought uh, by the uh, L2 NCAP, which is made using uh, lightweight tunnel. So uh, in conclusion, uh, the support for segment routing evolves quite a bit along those years. Uh, we have contributed to the whole SRV6 ecosystem. We extended uh, some other subsystem in order to support uh, new uh, behavior that were not possible only with the SRV6 subsystem at that time, for instance, the strict mode for the, for the birth. And um, I would like to, to stress that our work was uh, is, is and was driven by both research and real use cases, as uh, Professor Stefano and Ahmed uh, told before. So, for instance, we studied a lot of different mechanisms for compressing the seed list, and then we chose to implement the next seed. Or, for instance, we decided to implement the head end. Uh, uh, behavior with with uh, the reduced version in order to avoid the SRH header as much as we can when we need only to handle policies with one uh, one seat. So we are very active on the segment routing. Uh, so if you have any suggestions or uh, improvement or an ideas uh, about something that would be very useful, so let us know. Uh, let us know wherever you want. Uh, drop us a message. Talk with with me with us. And uh, thank you very much for your attentions. Grazie. Other questions? Oh, sorry, sorry. I was. 
<laughs> I was running away. Uh, question, uh, if you have some question. No question. Okay, thank you very much again. Grazie. So the next speaker is uh, Dan Bernier, and uh, Dan is participating remotely, so he would be sh he would be sharing from uh, his side. So hello everyone, I'm Daniel Bernier. I'm a director at uh, technical director at Bell. Uh, I could not be in presence because last week I was in Amsterdam, and this week I'm in KubeCon to present exactly the same thing. So uh, it actually fits well. So I'll be talking to you about some work we have been doing with the industry on uh, implementing SRV6 in Cilium. Um, I went into presentation mode, so if you have any questions, I will just ask them afterward, if you, uh, I can answer them afterwards. Um, I want to start by the problem. Why did we start doing this from the industry perspective? Is uh, When we look at how we do networking and how our developers build their applications, we realize there's a missing link between how we do the connectivity of the applications and how can we actually have our network systems be connected without having a too much overhead of complexity, which is a really big pain point in almost all uh, platforms we, we run and it's across uh, most of the operators. Uh, so that was the initial problem statement we came with. In a, new, in a utopian world, or it may be not utopian, uh, utopian, a developer that needs to build something on Kubernetes does not have to do an overhead of engineering to figure out what the network looks like. Most of them don't know what it is, and most of them don't really care that much, except being able to give them give a high level intent. So when we looked at this, when we started the work in segment routing and PLS, uh, we we were working to find a, a way to make it is simpler and more integrated with our application stack. And it became quite obvious that with SRV6, it was going to be a, a most a, a most effective compared to the MPLS data plane. So our requirements for uh, host networking, was all, and it's almost every industry-wide, if you look at all the operators, we see the same trend, is you want it to be application-centric, so less and less toil and overhead of complexity from a, from a developer uh, specification. If you look at Kubernetes, you would like this to be expressed at spec selector and label view, and not I, uh, in a complex uh, engineering details, or even for some developers, just the notion of a VRF and a VLAN is overwhelming. We want to be able to do massive simplification. If we do this at the host level, we want to be able to get efficiency gains of simplifying the underlying network, which we have over time over bloated with complexity. We want to be able to support massive scalability. Again, if we move things closer to the edge at the application level, we don't want this to be creating an overscale problem with our existing network. And by doing cloud, we kind of go to the level of simplifying rule of not abusing protocols. Not everything needs to be solved by an ITF standard in the world. And the day you evolve there, then you realize at some point, can the, cloud, the control be a bit more cloudified and leverage less of the existing toiling and looking more like how cloud is being de 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 developed and evolving over time. The biggest example I'm going to give you is a dreaded telco networking use case that we all know. Uh, having a, a cloud system, it was there with an open stack where we kind of passed the ball, but with Kubernetes, we said no. So having an environment where our applications have easy access to the network and uh, and be able to be in a, a isolated domain being able to attach to vrfs or any other construct in a simplified manner and not using the existing test for those who know this the the, the marvelous multis multi-network cni environment where actually doesn't solve almost any problem aside that creating secondary interface so this is how we looked at the problem when we look at this and to do this how can we do this with dis disruptive approaches and using the emerging technologies, which means SRV6? Before doing eBPF, I actually had done the same work with uh, with uh, FPGAs and P4 on hardware and smart NICs. The question was, how do we move up the stack getting closer to the application? I did some work in Kubernetes before, so tried to make it work with the NSM, which is a network service mesh, creating some kind of a, a, a orthogonal networking environment to create those VPNs. 
uh, uh, VRFs and other constructs. Uh, it worked. The, the trouble was it was not integrated into Kubernetes, so a lot of the rest of the capabilities of Kubernetes go go away, and you ended up with a secondary island. So a cool tech, but not really something that actually made it could become mainstream for networking. So this is where we went into Cilium. So in Cilium, we did the work uh, with Asa Valent, the 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 maintainers of the Cilium uh, open source project. We added the capabilities in, in the data plane to support SRV6 and also the capability of creating those VRFs, but also being able to go into a model where I don't have multiple interfaces, I don't have multiple default routes, everything is done dynamically in the eVPF data plane. So the most of the work we did in Cilium was yes, augment the VPN, the, the, the Cilium data plane to support SRV6, but the bulk was almost around how to create that, that ecosystem, that, that, uh, that logic so that you actually can create a VRF, attach it to a pod, create the egress policies and forward. But from a developer perspective, the overhead of complexity, aside from knowing a label associated to the VRF, the rest is almost hidden. So that the that, that was the biggest work we did. Uh, but once you do this, then you realize the beauty of SRV6 gets uh, gets aligned, and then you can any pattern becomes possible. So you've done the encapsulation, you've created your policy dynamically around the prefixes you wanted to have, and then using either the standards or the mechanism that exists already in SRV6, you can start looking at multi-domain interworking. So my SRV6 cluster can talk to a new VXLAN potentially or MPLS network that exists already. I don't have to recreate something. Uh, the gateways are actually quite flexible. Uh, and I can also do integrated service chaining, meaning that I can, from, the, from a host perspective, I can actually encode a network profile or service policy that will include either service chains or other behaviors. And from that on, I have done it in a cloud native way. Uh, that was also be able to integrate some work we did in earlier on with P4 around service proxying for physical hardware, which we presented at other conferences like Mobile World, uh, MPLS World Congress. So that was the logic behind uh, how to do Cilium, uh, the reasoning behind the logic for Cilium SRV6. The, the other approach was the ecosystem. Cilium being a ma massive uh, adoption across the uh, across the cloud ecosystem, so you kind of, you if you were to, for those who know what about bowling, if you were to send a bowling ball in an alley, you knew that with Cilium would cover almost all communities area implementations, so that we we know we were going well. So uh, from a data plane perspective, in eVPF, there's a lot of variations of eVPF. Uh, just before the speaker before me talked about the end of BPF that already exists. So there's a lot of variations of uh, SRV6 BPF, but in the Cilium version of it, uh, they made, they added, so they pulled some of the, from the, the Linux base, but also they added capabilities now for uh, both reduced and SRH versions. We, uh, and also being able to have the inline for those who know at the beginning of segment routing v6 there is an insert mode where you don't necessarily do need to do an outer ip and cap uh, so uh, right now the cdm supports uh, uh, the all three versions uh, reduced srh or insert plus working through uh, and it's a next step working through the uh, the uh, compressed version the cc um, from from then on there's the official CRDs that create attachment. This is part of the isovalent stream, not mainstream Cilium. And basically what happens from a pod membership perspective, so when you ask, add a pod, you have a label selector. Based on this, you will get the, to the right VRF construct that you need to have in a data path. Uh, the data path performs a VRF lookup, knowing based on this, he knows to which destination CIDRs he will be needed to forward. and um, a pod may belong to multiple VRFs. So it's actually, there's not a rule of a one-to-one -one mapping. You can actually have a pod talking to multiple VRF. Of course, if there's uh, uh, overlapping SIDs, the policy needs to be for a bit, uh, the, uh, overlapping CIDRs, the policy needs to be a bit more refined, but it works. The data path, you actually have multiple variations. You have the policy map that creates how you do the mapping between SIDs and VRF. 
the, then the, there's also the SID map that actually knows which to be which VRF there are, and then the, uh, how do you make those things? So programming an SRV6 eBPF maps, and we'll associate each pod traffic with an SRV6 SID as we do the the logic. Traffic encapsulation, basically basic IDs. This is done by this SRV6 egress policy. The VFRI, VRF ID plus destination ID will give you the right SID to, in, in, uh, to encapsulate. And then the, uh, the egress traffic, as it goes out from the pod into the EPPF data plane, will get encapsulated to the right destination. Uh, the data path is basically pretty uh, simple, simplified. Uh, you have the logic to the O stack that goes to the interface. There's the egress lookup. I don't need to show you this in details, but basically, based on the destination address, you know if it's a VRF lookup or no. And then if it's not, uh, it's not a VRF lookup. You forward basically as a normal behavior. So com compared to lots of models of doing communities networking, SRV6 in CDM is not a tunnel mode. SRV6 uh, uh, Cilium can still work in flat mode, like normal normal behavior. And in case there's a policy that needs to be encapsulated for egress traffic, then you encapsulate. So you basically have a logic where the, your your Kubernetes networking doesn't need to be completely transformed to SRV6. You can work uh, you can work in the, in the mixed mode. The decapsulation. Basically the same, you receive ingress traffic based on the known sins that you have in the data path. If known, it, de it decaps and sends to the appropriate pod. If unknown, it just it just uh, punts out. Uh, and the data path, you receive the interface. And based on the, the, the SID mapping, you know if it is if it is a SID, then you do the decapsulation. If it's an unknown SID, you just, uh, you just avoid. Uh, the logic behind this is you also have BGP. Right now in Cilium, we use the Go BGP implementation with interrupt with some other vendor BGP and FRR. Uh, BGP is used for the control plane. Uh, it will run, learn the rounds from the, VP, the from the PE devices. The Go BGP implementation is configured to the CRDs that define the VRF plus raw target associated. Uh, it maps the VPN v4 to the CDM egress policy, which is dynamic compared to a static policy. So based on the the, uh, the joined VRS within the pods and their information received from the, uh, B, the BGP control plane, you will be able to create the appropriate egress policy per pod so that when you need to try to go out, you have the, the proper SID mapping, VRF mapping, and uh, uh, encapsulation mode. Uh, for the uh, the VRF are created, as I explained, to the export raw target, and based on this, you create the, uh, the associated logic so that a, a pod can be advertised across multiple VRFs. Uh, and exactly the same thing, you use the, your your uh, SID map to be able to create the local SID entry that you send to the BGP control plane. Um, the next steps that we have been working on right now on the CDM is the sixth step is adding compressed support inside the overlay modes, uh, the, the tunnel modes. Uh, integration of split TE overlays, meaning being able to run a VPN into the SRH and the traffic engineering path into an IT, other IP header, like we see in uh, mainstream routers. Uh, investigation of the inline mode for IPv6 pods. So, for, uh, for example, if I have a v6 pod address, which is uh, uh, either ULA or, uh, or normal being routed, do I really need to encapsulate this into another IPv6 header, or can I just use the this, the extension header to add the, the proper uh, uh, resolution next up? That's investigation at the moment. Of course, if we do CSID and if we do other capabilities, we need to augment GoBGP. So looking with the community around the evolution of GoBGP to support compressed SID uh, and other features like under unnumbered interfaces and uh, uh, BFD. Uh, and of course, uh, as we go forward more towards cloud, uh, evaluation of not using BGP as a control plane, but leveraging in uh, uh, Components like the Cilium cluster mesh as a as a VPN as a control plane mechanism for the uh, Cilium clusters. All of this, uh, the Cilium version of SRV6, uh, I haven't put it in the slides, is targeted to be tech preview for the next release of Cilium, which is 113. Um, so that's basically it.
I probably went quite fast. So uh, if you have any question. Many thanks, Dan. Let me check here if we have any question. No? Sorry for the echo. Uh, sitting inside the, the Detroit Conference Center is a kind of a funny thing. So, so many thanks, Dan. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to forward them after uh, after the meeting. And uh, with this, we will jump to the next speaker, uh, Reshma and uh, Engineering uh, Director at Intel, to give us. Uh, an introduction to the SRV6 support in Sonic. Reshma, please go ahead. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, great presentation so far. Um, I'll be covering the Sonic portion of it, as Ahmed mentioned. Um, to give, um, let's see how to advance this slide. Um, Sonic is the industry adopted open source network operating system based on Linux that runs on switches in cloud and enterprise data centers and is currently being extended to support other network devices such as SmartNIC with the new Dash initiative. For the packet transformations needed within the devices in the network from edge to cloud, Sonic is actually capable of managing both the software and hardware components in all these network devices. Uh, the network stack has been production hardened in the data centers of some of the largest cloud service providers. The participation of cloud providers as well as other vendors allows for the community-driven use case um, and development. Sonic is built on switch abstraction interface, which provides the disaggregation. And uh, henceforth, I will refer to it as SI. I think that we have heard a lot from uh, all the presenters today and Dan Bernier about all the benefits that a service six gives. But um, just a couple of lines here. Uh, putting control in the hands of the network operators and giving them the control to solve the problems they, they face where traditional protocols are sometimes insufficient, mainly to meet the business SLAs for latency or seamless connectivity across network boundaries. Um, with that as a goal in mind, um, SRV6 provides that programming ability, traffic engineering capabilities, um, and deployment simplicity um, to network administrators. Um, yeah, we have seen the comm service providers are embracing SDN and IPv6 networks because this combination allows them to build large networks and cater to the SLA guarantees that they need. Implementing SRV6 in Sonic enables COSPs to have a single management interface with fine-grained network control while using existing telemetry features for our analytics, fault isolation, as well as to achieve um, proactive management and orchestration. In the book that's gone into um, implementing SRV6 and Sonic, we wanted to basically add all the features under the SRV6 umbrella in SI, the switch as abstraction interface, right at the beginning and then incrementally add um, implementations for those features in Sonic in phases. We added endnote behavior, including um, and, and, and including head end behavior with edge end caps, edge dot end caps, edge dot end caps reduced, you know, V6 end caps, and endnote behavior such as n dot t, n dot x, n dot dt4, dt6, dt46, et cetera, et cetera. In 2021-11 Sonic release, we added base SRV6 implementation in Sonic to support ingress, trans transit, and egress uh, node uh, behavior. H dot caps reduced, and DT4, DT6, DT46, any casted, and you know traffic steering on SID list was added. This year we have added micro SID support, and it will be available in Sonic 2022-11 release. A collaboration with Ahmed and Pablo from Cisco. Um, we look forward to adding more features like SBFD and enabling FRR integration into Sonic, uh, work that is uh, being done by Stefano and Carmine. And um, 
With this addition, we can actually enable more policies like B6 and CAP, etc. Bit about Sonic architecture. It comprises of the major software modules in separate independent Docker containers. And the centralized Redis database provides the publisher-subscriber communication between the functional components. Um, the components that are most interesting to SRV6 here, highlighted in the purple circle, BGP container runs um, one of the supported routing stacks like FRR. BGP state from external peering is received through TCP sockets, and the routes are written to the forwarding plane via FPM SYNC D interface. Zebra X has a acts as a traditional IP route manager and implements uh, route selection, interface lookups, and route redistribution services across protocols. It also pushes the computed FIB to um, kernel netlink interface and forwarding plane manager that I mentioned, the FPM interface. The FPM SYNCD is a daemon in charge of collecting FIB, uh, FIB state generated by Zebra and adds, it, adds this content into the application DB of Sonic. Um, within the Redis engine. These are the SRV6 SI attributes that we have, that, that have been added so far. Um, the slide uh, shows both ingress of the head end behavior and the endpoint behavior. What is depicted on the left is the head end function that adds capability to set the SID list for a given next hop. Lookup at the head end happens based on the allocated address blocks for the range of IPv6 destinations that are supposed to be processed within a given switch. Uh, we use a range map for that, a pre-routing ACL, I uh, suppose, for destination IP address, uh, IP ad IPv6 address-based uh, match to determine, the, to determine if SRV6 processing needs to be done. If there's a match based on destination IP, we obtain the next hop group, which gives us the SID list corresponding to this destination IP and that can be used for SRV6 encapsulation at the egress. Um, at the endpoint, if there's a match in the local SID table, which is again a uh, destination IP plus VRF based lookup, then corresponding endpoint behavior is executed. For example, if the end function flavor is n.dt4, corresponding IPv4 VRF is looked up for forwarding. If dt6 n, then you know, uh, IPv6 VRF is looked up, for example. Um, for the implementation in Sonic, we have added a new SRV6 arc in the switch state service module. Application DB will contain the SID list and policies con configured by the controller. SID list has the details of the encapsulation that is obtained from the next hop. The allocated addresses for the head end function lookup are part of the steer map. Um, and route table, of course, programs the SID list to next hop uh, uh, association. We also have added microSID support this year, and SRV6, SRV6 ARC um, actually supports that. Sonic will be enhanced for FRR as part of the integration effort that Carmine will be talking about next. And um, <clears throat> another picture to probably better explain what I just mentioned um, and some of the tables that are there in the application DB. The set of the allocated addresses in the application DB by the controller will get processed by the ARC agent, that is the new SRV6 ARC, which maps them to SI into the ASIC database um, tables within Sonic. The route table programs the SID list uh, to next hop association and then, uh, and that propagates uh, through the route table, through the route arc agent to route entry in the ASIC database. All the other tables processed um, are processed via SRV6 processing in the SRV6 org. Um, here we have both the local SID table and SID list table. Overall, SRV6 org translates the application DB entries to the ASIC DB after calling the SI APIs. Just to mention something a little bit different, we added P4 integrated network stack last year within Sonic, which brings P4 and SDN in Sonic. This year, we have added the generic SI extensions that might be helpful in programming some of the SRV6 components, especially for service chaining and running the VNFs in certain devices. Um, 
what is generic SI extensions? With the aim to allow logical extensions to the standard SI pipeline, generic SI extensions adds the infrastructure in Sonic to realize new features by adding new match action tables in the SI pipeline. It gives user the flexibility to extend an existing SI feature if you were to add uh, VNF like load balancing or to have other proprietary IP suppose in the applications that they want to write in the secure environment of Sonic Pins um, and have a uniform management interface across all their applications as well as all the devices in their network. For this, we assume the underlying SI pipeline as a baseline and want to create new tables as touch points to extending SI features. Yeah, so the extension tables could, you know, change the metadata that is used by the pipeline or could create new metadata that is not used by the pipeline's regular flow. And showing how it looks like in a use case to add load balancing as uh, one of our functions um, in this uh, diagram, um, the yellow rectangles show the fixed part and the red rectangles show the new uh, VNFs that we could add. It's very, very high level, but overall SRV6 gateway needs to terminate the incoming IPv4 V6 tra traffic and originates SRV6 tunnels. All of these tables could be added uh, using, using this. Um, and mainly I want to highlight about the SRV6 proxy, um, which is needed in the network that has portions of SR unaware devices and to bridge the, bridge the SRV6 islands. And service chaining requires the devices to run the network functions such as CGNAT or um, firewall load balancing in an SR aware network. Um, and all this requires, you know, decap and cap or modifying packet headers using predefined rules from the SDN. And they can be programs, programmed by using PIN's uh, generic SI extensions. Want to touch upon the Contributors in the SRV6 to SRV6 in the Sonic community. Here are the list, and uh, really happy to have been collaborating with everyone, and would like to see this um, deployed um, in in real networks. And please, uh, you know, would like to encourage you to uh, participate and partner with us in the SRV6 Sonic community. Yeah, thank you. And if any questions, I can take that. Many thanks, uh, Reshma. It was a great presentation. Let me check if we have any questions here on the chat. Uh, we don't have any, so maybe with that we can uh, jump to the last part of the presentation. So in this part, uh, Carmine is going to give us an update on the SRV6 features that are supported in FRR and what are the so what are the, the currently um, implemented feature and what are the next steps for SRV6 and FRR? So we, maybe, Reshma, you can stop sharing so we can share the screen from our side. Thank you. Sorry about that. I thought I already stopped. Thank you. No problem. Hi, everybody. I'm Carmine Scarpita, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Rome, Tor Vergata. My interest of research includes uh, uh, several topics like uh, SRV6, uh, Software Defined Networking, and SD1. And I have been working on FRR and Sonic for seven months. Uh, in particular, I'm developing a new feature relate, related to SRV6. Here is uh, the agenda for this presentation. Uh, we will talk about the FRR architecture then we will see uh, what are the features that are currently supported in the main line of uh, FRR. 
And then we will talk about the new SRV6 features that uh, we are implementing in FRR and the work of uh, integration that we are uh, doing. And finally, we will uh, conclude this presentation with uh, the next steps. So how does FRR works? We have uh, a Zebra, a daemon called Zebra, which provides uh, RIB functionalities and uh, acts as uh, an AP routing manager. And then on top of Zebra, we have uh, uh, several uh, routing protocols like BGP, Static, or SPF. And these protocols talk to Zebra through a, a protocol called the ZAPI and do things like uh, telling Zebra to install uh, routes in the kernel, for example. So Zebra talk to, to the Linux kernel through a, an interface, uh, which is a Netlink interface. And it is also able to push the routes to Sonic through a module called FPM. And this uh, communication between uh, the FPM and Sonic is based on uh, the um, on, on a TCP connection and the message used to encode, um, the format used to encode the, the messages is a uh, netlink. Okay, so uh, let's start from the service X support. Uh, the service X development in FRR has started recently and currently it supports uh, several functionalities like setting a service X locator or configuring uh, layer three VPN services or instantiating a service X behaviors. And uh, uh, the support for a service X involves uh, uh, several demons like Zebra, BGP and Sharp. Uh, our work in FRR is uh, something like adding new service X, service X features and we are also uh, started to integrate the features that we are uh, developing um, in FRR in uh, the main line. And also we are working on the integration of uh, SRV6 functionalities uh, in Sonic. Let's start from the first functionality, which is, uh, which is uh, the SRV6 locator. According to R the RFC 8986, an SRV6 seed is an IPv6 address which has uh, the following structure. It has a block, a node, a function, and argument. The block is uh, an address space from which uh, the operator can allocate SRV6 seeds. The node is an identifier for the node that instantiated the seed. Function is uh, an identifier for a local behavior that must be executed on the node. And finally, we have the argument which is optional and can be used to encode additional properties or information that are useful to process the, the behavior, the, the, the seed. The block part and node part together form the so-called SRV6 locator. The RFC does not specify uh, how many bits uh, these parts should be. So uh, it gives the operator the freedom to, to choose the length of uh, the locator of the function and the argument. Here is uh, an example of how you can uh, allocate seeds. Typically, you allocate one locator on a node, and then from this locator, you allocate several seeds. So for example, you have uh, a locator FC0001, and from this locator, you have a seed one, seed two, seed three, several seeds. All these seeds will share the same block and node parts, but they will have, will have different function and arguments. What about the support for SRV6 locator in FRR? So in FRR, currently, you can configure locators using the VTY shell. So uh, how you can do this? You enter the shell, then you type segment routing, SRV6, locators, locator lock1, where lock1 is the name that you want to assign to the locator. And then you can specify the prefix of the locator 
for example, FC0001 slash 48. And you can also define the structure of the seeds allocated from this locator. So, uh, for example, you can provide the length of the function part with the argument func bits. You can specify the length of the block part with the argument block len, and you can specify the length of the node part with the argument node len. So then you have also another command, which is called behavior microseed. And this command specifies the locator as a microseed that all the seeds allocated from this locator are considered as microseed. So uh, what about the support for these features in the mainline FRR currently? The func bits uh, is uh, uh, also in mainline. Block LAN and node LAN have been merged uh, recently. And then the behavior microseed functionality is not yet supported in mainline, but we already have an implementation on our fork of FRR. The implementation is open source and public, and we, we will open a, a, a pull request to integrate these functionalities in the mainline. Then uh, we have another feature interesting, which is interesting, and this feature is uh, the support for BGP services uh, based on SRV6. So we want uh, to support the layer 3 services, uh, uh, layer 3 VPN services in Sonic using BGP as control plane, SRV6 as data plane technology. And then we have already an RFC that uh, extend BGP to support this kind of services. So for example, layer 3 VPN services using SRV6. And uh, how you can use uh, uh, BGP to, to configure a layer 3 VPN service? So you use BGP to advertise the reachability of services of a particular VPN from an ingress P to ingress P nodes. And then we have uh, the ingress P that advertises a set of prefixes and tell, that, uh, tell the ingress nodes that these prefixes are uh, reachable using an SRV6 seed. And then we have uh, the ingress P that uh, uh, imports the, the routes, uh, the prefixes advertised by the ingress P. And then it is able to encapsulate the traffic of, a, or of the VPN. To support this kind of services, the RFC includes new TLV messages. And this TLV can be attached to the BGP update message to carry the information about the SID. What is contained in these messages? We have an SRV6 layer 3 service TLV. This service includes uh, a seed information sub TLV that defines the properties of the seed, in particular the seed value like FC0001100, for example, and it also includes uh, the endpoint behavior uh, uh, associated to the seed which can be, for example, UDT4 or UDT6 behavior. And then we also have another uh, sub-sub-TLV, which is the seed structure sub-sub-TLV, and this message encodes the, the structure of the seed expressed in terms of length of block, node, function, and argument parts. So what about uh, the support for uh, these services in FRR? In FRR, you can uh, already uh, configure a, a layer 3 VPN service um, in this way. You can configure the egress P to advertise the prefixes uh, using a seed, and then you can configure the ingress P to import these prefixes. The SRV6 architecture uh, allows to support the, both IPv4 and IPv6 address families using a single seed, which is bound to the UDT46 behavior. We have an implementation of uh, this, 
when I prepared the slide, it uh, was not uh, not yet merged in the mainline. Now these being functionalities uh, are integrated in mainline. Next uh, feature is uh, about the source IPv6 address for uh, encapsulated packets. So we want a mechanism to set the address, uh, the source address for the service six packet. Uh, why do we need uh, um, this? Because when we encapsulate a packet in a service six, we add an outer IPv6 header and we need to specify a source IPv6 address to use in this header. In Linux, uh, by default, uh, the source address is uh, the um, one address of the egress interface, but you can set a different address using this command, IP SR tunnel source set. But this approach is only for Linux, works only for Linux. We need a mechanism more general to set the address both in Linux and Sonic. And we, uh, are in, uh, we have implemented um, this functionality. So uh, in, you can enter the v 2 shell and then you type segment routing, SRV6, encapsulation, source address. And this address is installed both in Linux and Sonic. So this is not yet in the, supported by the mainline distribution of FRR, but we have an implementation of, uh, of this feature in uh, our fork. And we plan to integrate these functionalities in mainline. We will open a, a pull request very soon. Let's move to the next uh, feature, which is the support for uh, static uh, allocation of behaviors. We have a daemon in, uh, in FRR, which is a static D. Uh, this daemon uh, handles the installation and deletion of static routes. And then um, we extended this, uh, uh, this daemon to support the static allocation of the SRV6 endpoint behaviors with a command line um, shown in, uh, in this uh, slide. So this feature uh, is not yet uh, supported in the mainline distribution of FRR. We have the implementation on our fork and this implementation already supports the allocation of uh, uh, some behaviors like um, UDT4, UDT6, and UDT46. We are uh, implementing other behaviors uh, and then we, we will also integrate this functionality in, uh, in the mainline. Let's move to the last part of this presentation, which is about uh, the, the Sonic uh, um, the, the service 6 supporting Sonic. This slide uh, is a reminder for the Sonic architecture. So we have in Sonic many components. In particular, we are interested in the BGP container, which is shown in this slide. And we have a daemon in uh, Sonic, which is called FPM Sync D. FPM Sync D receives uh, routes information um, from, F, from FRR. And then FPM SyncD uh, writes these uh, updates, these uh, routes information in the Redis uh, um, database, which is uh, used then to update uh, um, the FIB of Sonic. So let's see in detail how the, this mechanism work. We have uh, um, the routing demons in FRR that uh, compute uh, their uh, best routes and send these routes to, to Zebra through the Z API. Then Zebra computes the best routes across uh, all the demons and install these uh, routes uh, both in the Linux kernel using Netlink. And it also pushes the route to Sonic uh, through, the, um, through a module, which is the FPM module. Sonic has uh, a component, uh, the component uh, FPM SyncD that listens on uh, a specific port, port 2620, and FPM periodically attempts to connect to, to this port. Once the connection is up, 
uh, Zebra sends through the FPM a, a complete copy of the forwarding table in uh, FPM SyncD. And uh, the route messages are encoded in uh, Netlink format. So FPM should be able to encode uh, not only the routes, but also the service X behaviors in Netlink format and to push these uh, behaviors to FPM SyncD. The implementation in mainline does not support the, the encoding of the service X behavior in Netlink format. We already implemented this functionality on our fork. And again, we will integrate these functionalities in mainline very soon. Last part of the presentation is the, the implementation of SRV6 in Sonic. So, as I said, FPM SyncD waits for notification about route additions and deletions. And these notifications also include the information related to SRV6, for example, installing or deleting behaviors. FPM SyncD uh, parses all the received update messages and deliver this message to each message to the appropriate handler. So for example, when FPM SyncD receives a, 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 a notification about the installation of a behavior, it should pass this message to the handler for um, used for SRV6 information. And then uh, this information is propagated to Redis and from, and from Redis it is uh, uh, installed in the FIB. So uh, the implementation of uh, Sonic in mainline does not support uh, this uh, SRV6 handler, so it is not able to perform the decoding of the SRV6 related messages. And we have an implementation of Diffuser future on our uh, fork of Sonic. We will integrate this uh, functionality in the mainline of Sonic. So to conclude my presentation, we have uh, several uh, functionalities supported in, uh, in the mainline distribution of FRR, like the service 6 locator and many service 6 behavior supported. We already implemented many additional features that, uh, that we have on our fork of FRR. For example, uh, the, the support for service 6 in static T and extension to FPM to support the encoding of, um, of the SRV6 information. And we plan to continue the integration of these functionalities of uh, our implementation in the Ferrari mainline. And we also plan to continue the, um, the integration of SRV6 in Sonic and uh, to develop uh, new functionalities in FRR. For example, the support for more SRV6 behavior and the support for SRV6 traffic steering. So thanks for your attention. Oh, yeah. Any question? Question, yeah. Okay. Uh, you mentioned static via PGP, yes. Uh, about it even in that power supporting SRV6. Do you know of anybody working on adding SRV6 for other routing protocols like OSPF3, RSIS? The best of my knowledge, uh, no. The OSPF, uh, the, the support is missing uh, for um, in OSPF currently. Mm -hmm. okay. But, but uh, with your changes, I guess the, the infrastructure in FR would be there to, to be able to, to add this uh, to make the changes to the uh, OSPF. Or Sorry? I can, I can, can. Yeah, yeah. With, with your changes now in, in Zebra, um, all the infrastructure that's required to, to um, be able to add as a support was to um, OSPF v3 in FR would, would be there. So um, yes. it would just require changes yeah. to, to OSPF v3. Yeah, yes, we, we extended Zebra and, and then OSPF relies on the functionalities, uh, on the service 6 functionalities that we. Um, Added in Zebra, yeah, okay. yeah. but uh, some, some something is required uh, also in uh, OSPF to support. Yes. Um, it's a simple matter of yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, so basically, back to your question. So we started with the infrastructure part that was needed by the by most of the of the routing demons. So starting from Libra, and now once we have this infrastructure, we started from the basic services like basic layer three VPN services to have just uh, how to say over um, best effort uh, layer three VPN over the service um, using the service six, then. Uh, we continue the, the development of having more like underlay functionalities using uh, using uh, ISAS uh, for example uh, implementation. So it will come for sure. <laughs> it's uh, it's a uh, it's Carmen doing doing uh, the work by himself. So he have unfortunately only two hands to write <laughs> the code. But uh, yeah, once those two hands are uh, free of PGD, then uh, they will go to ISAS. I'm making interest with those PFO3, so let's see oh. how that is going to so where we can try forces. Then we need another two hands. Uh, okay. Other uh, question? Uh, do you still mimic in Apparat? Do you mimic the Cisco CLI? CLI? Because as far as I understand, uh, Apparat was still trying to uh, use the same semantics of the commons. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it is good to have uh, a, a CLI that uh, is compliant to Cisco CLI. Uh, as someone working for Cisco, maybe I can take this one. Yeah, sure. when, we start, when we start to deploy the CLI, so you, you need to start from something that is good and is working properly. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the only good one that we found is the one from Cisco. I mean, I haven't touched Cisco device for the last two years, so just yeah. Yeah. No, but, no, but if, you, if you use if you use FRR right now, you will be able also to use the Cisco CLI. So they are quite aligned. Oh, okay, cool. But uh, uh, I think I think the answer is actually more complicated as people uh, to people who started FRR. Uh, I don't uh, want to give the history, but behind no, no, this no, one, I think I think there is an important aspect here, right? And I think you covered it in a few seconds ago, which is FRR has an interface, uh, a regular uh, CLI interface. But if you wrap it inside. Kubeless or, or Sonic or any other OS, that OS provides an interface, but not necessarily a You don't actually have to go, and, and there is, and the biggest part of Sonic is an IPC interface, right? So you're not actually, it doesn't matter what's inside, how the CLI, which is a process that's going and configuring up our looks like. Mm -hmm. There are multiple ways to configure up yeah, I know, but this, this uh, presentation was mostly about the FRR. Yeah, the native FRR comes with a CLI demon that yeah. you can go and draft with. But most places where it gets deployed, if you it deploys as far as an OS package, typically you don't just get an routing site and say, let's see what this does for me. Okay. And, and yeah. one more question uh, about Redis and its usage in, in uh, your implementation. So, uh, as far as I understood, there is only one publisher and one consumer. Uh, what's the reason to use that? It's not really a part of our implementation. The, the, the Redis part is more related to Sonic. So, this is a, this is the database that they use in Sonic for the RDP. What basically FRR does is that when you compute the route, you send them to Sonic, and then Sonic uses Redis. So, we write to the database that they use. So if they decide to choose another database, the interface will write to the new database. So it's a Sonic choice more than uh, FRR even uh, choice or our choice. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thanks, uh, Carmen. So I think with that we are done with the, with the content for this uh, workshop. So I would like to to um, thank all of the speakers today. Uh, I will not thank myself, so I will thank all <laughs> the, the, the other speakers. So Professor Stefano Salsano from the University of Rome Tor Vergata, then uh, Dan Bernier from Bell Canada, uh, Andrea Mayer from uh, University of Rome, Reshma from Intel, and um, uh, Carmen, who gave us the last update on uh, on FRR, and I would like to thank the NetDev community and uh, before all uh, all of the listeners and, and people for their attention during this uh, this uh, workshop. So thank you very much, and hope to see you next time in NetDev for another SRV6 workshop with all of these features uh, that we talked about today are merged, and maybe some more <laughs> new features came up. Okay, thank you. Thank you.